I remember to do this. All right, thanks everybody on Zoom and everybody in class that's joined. So I'm gonna stop my video, okay? Gonna minimize the chat. All right, so um, there were, so if you haven't picked up your midterm, I brought them here. Uh, generally speaking, I keep them in my office. My office tends to stay open even if I'm not there. So if you're on Zoom or you're not on campus right now and you need to pick them up, you just need to be able to get to my office and just take yours, all right? Um, the corrections are going to be due Monday. So I did notice a lot of folks didn't get a chance to pick it up on Wednesday so that I moved the deadline to Monday. If you've already submitted your corrections, thank you. I will get those graded this weekend, hopefully, um, and give you your points back. Great. Any questions on the corrections? Nope. Uh, yeah, if you're having trouble with particular questions, lecture 21, um, I did also post an additional video covering the last two questions that we didn't get to. Um, so on the course website, that is all available. Uh, homework six uh, was out last Wednesday. Just a reminder, it's due this coming Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. Uh, you guys should definitely, um, you should do it uh, and submit it on time, okay? Uh, there are two versions actually. So for the, there's always the written portion, which is gonna cover a bunch of graph stuff. Hopefully that's pretty comfortable for you guys. Um, one of the questions actually has to do with the stuff we're gonna cover today. So you might not be able to do it yet, but you will be able to do it after today's lecture. Um, and then the coding is going to be, you're going to be implementing four of your midterm solutions in actual code. So, so you're gonna practice going from pseudocode to C++ or Python. Um, yeah, both options are available. The auto grader supports both. Uh, so whichever you prefer, uh, you can work on them. Any questions on that? Nope, great. All right, last announcement. Uh, we are having mock interview signups. So this is a thing run by Meta and some of my coworkers at Meta. So the way they're gonna work is these are technical mock interviews and you are going to be given verbal feedback at the end of the interview as to how well you did or you know, things you can improve on. Um, there's a sign up right here. Please sign up. The slots are going pretty quick. Uh, the te mock technical interviews are at the beginning at the beginning of April, I believe. Any questions on this? Has anybody signed up already? All right, three three people. Anybody that has not signed up, why not? <laughs> okay, we're not going to keep any written record, so nothing gets written down. Uh, these are not real interviews, so it's it's really like even if you completely bomb it, um, nothing bad is going to come of it at all. So it is an opportunity for you to get feedback on an actual interview performance, okay? Uh, and these are, yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Today we're going to cover Dijkstra's algorithm. So we teased it a little bit before spring break, but we're going to review some of that. So uh, yeah, everybody, welcome back. We're gonna illustrate some key examples where weighted graphs are useful, and that's gonna motivate something known as Dijkstra's algorithm, which is an algorithm to solve the single source shortest path problem in weighted graphs with positive edge weights, okay? So again, the problem we're trying to solve is called the single source shortest path problem, okay? So this says, I want to know the shortest path from some source vertex to all other vertices in my graph, where my graph is weighted. So if my graph is not weighted, uh, what algorithm would you use? If it's an unweighted graph and you wanna find the shortest path from a single source to all other nodes. Yes, breadth first search. Okay, so breadth first search is gonna give you the shortest path uh, because it does it by layer, right? It does like all the neighbors that are one step away, two steps away. So now we're going to generalize it. We're going to essentially generalize breast first search uh, to tackle graphs that have positive edge weights. Okay. So you can't have negative edge weights. Um, I'm going to skip this. It's not that important. Let me close this down. So this is actually a really useful algorithm in general. It actually comes up a lot in many, many different applications. I think this is probably one of the most useful graph algorithms that you're going to see. Um, it does not get asked that often in interview problems, I would say, because it's a, it's pretty advanced. But 
Um, I think it's a lot more useful than depth first search or breadth first search or even strongly connected components that we've covered. So a few examples to think about in the real world is you may have a transportation network. For example, again, Google Maps comes up a lot, but you can imagine that people find it useful to find like what is the shortest path, let's say from NCAT campus to anywhere else in Greensboro, where maybe you're using buses, you're biking, you're walking, maybe you have the option to take Ubers or Lyfts, maybe you're driving, right? Okay, so this problem can be represented as a graph where the edges can tell you like the different modes of transportation you're taking and the edges have weights associated with them, okay? So edge weights probably have something to do with time, you know, like how long it takes, maybe something to do with money too, because maybe you're not just trying to get there the fastest way, you're also trying to get there like the way that is fastest given that I only have $20, right? So I can't take an Uber for 50, right? Um, and also maybe hassle, right? Like maybe you don't wanna have to switch uh, bus stops fifth, like three times, even if that's actually faster. Maybe you'd rather take a longer route, but be on the bus once, you know? and never, never switch, right? Uh, or maybe you don't wanna like wait out in the rain, right? So you wanna minimize the amount of time you're like standing still, okay? So this is a really complicated problem, I would say to solve in general. Another example that's very common, and, but you, you can use a modified version of Dijkstra to try to tackle some of these problems, okay? Another example uh, that you use all the time, so who here has taken a networking class? Oh, a couple of folks. Okay, so you guys might have seen this example before, but anytime you go to, a, so the internet is really just a collection of a bunch of computers, right? Uh, and they just know how to talk to like each other. They don't necessarily know where everything is. So anytime you make a connection, so there's actually a program in your computer called Traceroute that will list out uh, what are all the different computers you talk to in order to get to a particular website. Um, yeah, so this is an example of the output for like going to fz.ch. Uh, I chose this URL because it has many hops, so many different computers that you go in between. But the idea here is that you can model the internet. Okay, so this is not the websites, but the computers themselves. You can model that as a graph. And then you can ask questions like, for each path, you know, each path is gonna have some sort of cost, right? Like how long is my packet gonna take to get from point A to point B, right? Um, how congested are different lines, right? Maybe some line, transcontinental lines that under the ocean are basically like down, so you don't wanna take those, et cetera. And the question that all of your routers answer and actually your computers answer every time you go to a website is how should we send the information, okay? So which computer should I send my packet to? And then that computer also answers which computer do I send it to next, right? So every time you go to any website on the internet, you're not going directly to that website. You're usually going through several hops. Um, and that's, I guess, like one beauty of the internet is that if any one part goes down, you can reroute around other hops, okay? But this is, again, another example where you might wanna try to solve this idea of like single source shortest path problem, right? So from my computer, what's the fastest way to get to a computer that has facebook.com on it, right? What's the fastest way to get to google.com, right? Cool. Um, TLDR, these are like pretty hard problems, I would say. They have been solved, people are working on them, but they're really difficult. And the main reason is that the cost may change, right? So the cost is not clear, right? Like we said, if it's raining, maybe the cost of biking is higher, right? So it's dynamic, right? It depends on the weather. It depends on your preferences. Um, if an internet link is congested, maybe the, the cost of routing the packet along that link is higher, right? Um, you might not know the entire graph when you begin, right? So another, like you might not know all the possible ways you can commute from one place to the other, you might not know the entire network, right? Um, and the other problem, the other reason these real world problems are difficult is because we want to do these tasks really quickly, right? So you don't want your computer to spend a minute figuring out how to get to google.com, right? You want it to be like milliseconds, it already knows, and then it takes you there, right? Um, or for biking, right? Like maybe I have time to bike to NCAT from my house, right? 
but I don't want to think about whether I should bike or not bike, right? Like maybe I don't have to, I don't have the time to actually think about it, right? I just, I have the time to do it, but I don't have the time to like figure out if this is the optimal, right? Um, yeah, that's kind of a joke, but it didn't land very well. So <laughs> let's move on. Um, so what we're going to do in this lecture though, is we are going to ignore all of these difficult questions, but this is stuff that you would have to think about in, a real world application of Dijkstra's algorithm, right? In today's lecture, we're going to give you a graph and we're going to tell you the weights of each edge. And your goal is find the shortest path, right? Very simple, very straightforward. When you get to the real world, you're usually not given the graph. You might not know the whole graph. You might not know what the weights are. The weights might change, right? So it gets pretty complicated. All right. So back to our simple examples, we covered this before spring break. This is a, a map of NCAT. Uh, and our goal is going to figure out the shortest path from Aggie Village, so from this center node to all the other nodes, right? Uh, this is a even more simplified <laughs> example. I removed some of the nodes. And these are the edge weights that we put. So we said, let's say it's, it takes one minute to walk between these different places. So if I walk directly from Aggie Village to Aggie Terrace, that's going to take me 25 minutes. That's what that edge says. If I, you know, one minute here, one minute here, et cetera. And your goal is to find the shortest path from Aggie Village to everywhere else. Okay. So the algorithm that does this is called Dijkstra's algorithm. That's, a, that's the name of the guy who discovered it, I guess, slash invented it. So if you ever discover a cool algorithm, you might get it named after yourself. Just keep that in mind. Okay, pretty cool. Uh, the intuition of how Dijkstra's algorithm works is instead of thinking about an abstract graph, pretend that each of your nodes are marbles on a table. I should have brought like a prop. <laughs> and you're going to connect the marbles with string. And the length of the string is going to depend on the, the weight of the edge, right? So going back to this, you can imagine I'm going to cut a string that's one centimeter long, and I'm going to use that to connect Aggie Village to the clock tower, right? I'm going to use a string that's 25 centimeters long, so much longer, to connect Aggie Village to Aggie Terrace. And the intuition here as to why this works is, well, to run Dijkstra's algorithm, start from your starting position. So if you want to start from Aggie Village, start from Aggie Village, and then just lift it off the ground. OK, so again, this is not how you code it in a computer, because like lift off the ground doesn't make any sense in computer terms. But intuitively, this is what your computer is going to do, right? Once you lift it off the ground, you're going to say, I'm done with this vertex. I have found the shortest path to this vertex, OK? So by definition, the very first one, you're done as soon as you pick it up, because the shortest path is 0, right? Then you keep lifting it, and you let gravity do the work for you, OK? So if you keep lifting it, because this string is the shortest, the next node that's gonna be picked up is gonna be the clock tower, right? So Aggie Village is connected to clock tower and to another node, but this is the shortest edge. So it's gonna get picked up next, right? So now this is actually the shortest distance from Aggie Village to clock tower, it's one, right? There's other ways to get to it, but those are longer. And they're longer because the strings are longer, which means we haven't picked them up yet. And then you keep going, right? So the next one here is you're going to keep pick up the health center, which is also distance one away, right? And so on and so forth. The next one you're going to pick up is Aggie Suites. And then if you keep lifting up your, your graph, you're going to finally pick up Aggie Terrace. And you're going to realize that the shortest path is actually 21. You first go to Clock Tower, and then you go to Aggie Terrace. Okay. Now, this is going to create a tree. So you guys should get familiar. This is called a Dijkstra tree, I guess. So same as BFS, same as DFS. Anytime you run them, they create a tree um, because you try to make sure there's no cycles in, in, what, in the paths you take. And the shortest paths are the lengths along this tree, OK? So that's the intuition. Now the question, uh, any, any questions on like the intuition of what Dijkstra wants to do, OK? So now we're going to cover the actual implementation. All right. So how do we actually implement this? Because in your computer, you don't have strings and you don't have gravity. OK, so you can't uh, you can't implement what we just talked about directly. So 
let's go through an example first. So again, our goal is how far is a node from Aggie Village, okay? So the way the algorithm works is very similar to what we just described in terms of picking things up from the ground, all right? First, I'm gonna mark everything as being on the ground, which means I am not sure, right? So every single node is gonna have a value associated with it, a status, which is gonna say, I'm not sure, which in our intuition means it's still on the table, all right? I'm also gonna have a status called I'm sure, which means I've finished you. I know for sure the shortest path, which again, to our intuition is we've picked you up off the table, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna track a value called DV. So you can imagine an array that's of the size of the number of nodes in the graph. And for each node, we're gonna say, what is my best overestimate for the distance to that node from Aggie Village, okay? So to start with, this is gonna start at zero for Aggie Village. So I'm not saying I'm done with it, but I'm saying my best overestimate is zero. Cause actually that's where I start. And then everything else an overestimate that is obvious is infinity, right? Where infinity represents I can't get to you, you know, you're too far away. So if I know nothing else, I can definitely say that in the worst case, you're gonna be an infinite <laughs> number of steps away from me, all right? So that's where we start. And then what we do is we, pick up the node, the, the next closest node from the ground, right? So everything's on the ground now, and we're going to pick up the next closest. So we look at all the ones that are on the ground, so all the ones that are not sure, okay? And we pick up the one with the smallest estimate, du. So intuitively, what's the, what that's doing is it's picking the one that has the shortest string, right? So the next one is going to get picked up. Uh, so in this case, if we do this, we will pick Aggie Village, okay? This is my current node, that's another state. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna update all of you's neighbors. So everything that you is connected to, I'm gonna update its estimate for how far away it is to be the minimum of its current estimate, okay? Or du, the estimate of u, plus the edge weight from u to v, okay? Somebody wanna explain to me what this update is doing? Yeah, so it's basically saying, so again, remember, DV is my best overestimate, okay? So they all start as infinity to start with, except for the one I start with. And then what this is doing is saying, well, if I pick, if I'm going to pick Aggie Village off the ground, okay, then my, my best estimate for the shortest path is going to change for some of my nodes. It's going to change for the ones I'm connected to, okay? If I don't have an edge to you, my overestimate is not going to change. I'm going to leave it as it is. But if I have an edge to you, then there's two options. Either I go the way I was going before, whatever that estimate was, that's DV, or I first go to U, right? And then I go from U to V, right? Those are the two options I'm considering. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to improve my overestimate by taking the minimum of the two, okay? So if essentially the intuition is, I'm gonna consider the paths, I'm gonna consider these two edges and I'm gonna ask the question, is it better? Like, can I get to these nodes faster by first going to Aggie Village and then taking an edge? Or is my previous estimate better, right? Whatever my previous one was. To start with, my previous estimates are all infinity. So like on this first step, who can tell me, like, what, what is this estimate going to be? And what's this estimate going to be after I do this update? Uh, sure, let's start with Clock Tower. Who wants to? What's... That one's just one, right? So it's going to compare infinity, which is the current estimate, to du is zero plus the weight of the edge one, right? And it's going to take the minimum of those two. So it's just going to be one. 
And then what about this one? Yeah. So 21 is the answer, but what, are, what am I gonna write here, right now in this one step? Right, so I'm, I'm using this formula. Yes, Serena? Yes, 25, right? Because I'm, I don't, I have not yet found, so you're right that the shortest path is here and then here, but I don't know that yet, right? Because I just started with this node and I'm only looking at its neighbors, okay? So what I do, and again, remember DV is not necessarily the shortest path yet. It is just an overestimate that it tries to get closer and closer as the algorithm goes. So here I'm actually gonna write 25 because I'm gonna take the minimum of infinity and zero plus 25, which is the edge weight from U to V, okay? Um, so that is what we do. We put a one and a 25. And then we mark, we mark you as sure. So we say, we are now done with you. We have picked it off the ground. We no longer care about it. And actually what we're gonna say later is that as soon as a node gets marked as sure, then we have found the shortest path and the shortest path is given by whatever is in this box, okay? So this one, we have 25 right now. This is wrong. The shortest path is 21. But what's gonna happen is when we mark it sure, whatever number is here will be 21 by the time we mark it, mark it sure, okay? So we do that and then we repeat, all right? So then we go back to this step. We pick the not sure node U with the smallest estimate DU, all right? So again, the intuition is as we're lifting it off the table, we're gonna pick you know, the next marble that has the shortest string. And in our case, we're gonna pick, which, which, which marble do we pick here? When we go back to this step. Yeah. Yeah, you pick, you pick clock tower because it has the smallest estimate one, okay? So in a way, you're saying, I started here. I considered all the nodes I could go to. And the one I'm gonna go to next is the one that's closest to me. And then you're gonna repeat that. You're gonna consider all the nodes you can go to, and the one you're gonna go to do next is the one that's closest to, okay? So we, play, we pick clock tower. So clock tower has three neighbors, okay? This one, this one, and this one, right? What happens when we update them? So what, what are the new values of DV for the graph? Who can, who can walk me through that? All right, so again, I am in this step. I am updating all of you's neighbors and clock tower has three such that their new estimate is the minimum of their previous estimate or du plus the weight of the edge connecting them. Uh, Aggie Terrace becomes 21. Oh, sorry, right. So Aggie Terrace becomes, again, the minimum of 25, which is what it's currently is. Intuitively, that's saying, I think the shortest path is this. That's what this is saying. And what I'm comparing it to is I'm saying, well, what if instead of going this way, whatever it was, what if instead I first go to Clock Tower? I already know the answer is one for that. And then I go to Aggie Terrace. So that's why I do one plus, 20, one plus 20. And the minimum of that is 21. So yes, this will get replaced by 21, right? Health center, the same thing, right? Currently, our best guess is we can't actually get to it. We have not found any path. What if we went to clock tower first and then to health center? Well, then the distance is two, okay? What about this other Aggie village? Do we update that? Right, we don't because we would say, well, my current best estimate is that it takes zero steps to get there. What if instead I first go to clock tower and then I go back to Aggie village? The answer is gonna be two, which is longer. So because we're taking the minimum, we won't update it, okay? So that is exactly what happens. 
But that's exactly what Dijkstra says you should do. And then we mark uh, clock tower as done. Okay. And then we repeat. So which one do we go to next? So again, we go, we go back up to pick the not sure node with the smallest estimate. Yeah. Yeah, you go to health center because it, it's two, right? There's, there's only three left guys. It's 21, infinity or two. And you go to the one that has the smallest, right? So we go to health center and then we update all of health center's neighbors, right? So health center only has two neighbors. This one's not gonna get updated because we're actually done with it, but you can imagine. What does this get updated to? Six, right? One, one. So that actually gives me two. So it'll be two plus four, which is six. So that gets updated to six. Uh, then we mark it as done because we're actually done with health center. And then what do, we, what do I go to next? There's only two options. Aggie Suites. Then I update Aggie Suites again. What is the comparison I'm doing here? I have 21. What's the other number? 28, right? What does the 28 represent? It represents this other weird path, right? So maybe it's shorter, right? Like if this was five, then that path would be shorter. And then we would take that one, right? But it's not, it happens to be longer. So we actually leave it the same. And then Aggie Terrace is the only one left. We pick it, it has no neighbors or all the neighbors it has, we've already finished. So they're not gonna get updated and we mark it as done and then we're done. And the claim is, there's two claims. Right after all nodes are sure, what we say is that the shortest distance from Aggie Village to V is going to be given by these values that we kept track of. All right, that's the claim. So this is Dijkstra's algorithm in pseudocode. All right, it's actually really hard to implement. I might ask you guys to do it in the next homework assignment. Um, but yeah, the, any questions on this pseudocode? This is what we just walked through. So all vertices get set to not sure. We have some array that keeps track of the distances. We set them all to infinity, except for the starting node, we set it to zero. And then while there are some nodes left, pick the not sure node with the smallest estimate. For all the neighbors, update it to be this, and then finish you, and then repeat, okay? Uh, there is a replet that has, the implementation. So I probably won't give you this as homework, but maybe a modified version. Okay. This is Dijkstra's algorithm. All right. That's the main point of today's lecture is for you guys to be familiar with this algorithm and understand it. This is the pseudocode. Okay. There are a lot of details that I'm not going into here. Who can think of one detail that I am not covering in this pseudocode where you're like, how would I even implement that in C++? Yeah. Uh, right. So implementation of edge weight is one thing. We just say edge weight UV, right? That means we're going to have to modify our graph to not only keep track of what nodes are connected, but also in a matrix or in a hash map somewhere, we need to be able to keep all the weights of the edges, right? So that's an implementation detail. What else is an implementation detail? Huh? Yeah, so this, right? Again, this is pseudocode. While there are not sure nodes, okay? I'm not telling you how to keep track of that, right? Like you could use a vector of Booleans and then turn them to true when they're sure and then iterate over the vector to find the next one, okay? That's kind of slow, I'll tell you that. Um, there are other ways. Um, the other thing that's actually very interesting too is this one. Pick the not sure node with the smallest du, okay? Again, you could use a vector, right? We're keeping the du's in an array and you could say, well, every time I run this line, I'm gonna iterate over that vector and find the smallest one, All right? That's O of N, okay? But there are other ways to implement this and we're gonna, we're gonna cover it in a little bit, but this is the main gist of the algorithm. Uh, the main questions you should always ask yourself is, does this algorithm work? 
And then if it does work, how fast is it? Okay. So the answer to does it work is yes, it does work. And we have 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, let's go through this. So why does this work? Okay. Here's the theorem. Okay, here's the thing we're trying to prove that suppose we run Dijkstra on some graph. So again, this is not our example anymore. This is an arbitrary graph with weighted edges. All right, this is how you would prove that this algorithm works. At the end of the algorithm, the claim is that dv, whatever number is stored in dv, all right, is the actual shortest distance from s to v. Okay, that's the claim at the end of the algorithm. Now, here are the two things you need to prove in order to show this, okay? First, we're gonna show that for all vertices, dv is an overestimate of the actual distance. So it is never less than the actual distance, okay? We're gonna show that no matter when you look at the algorithm, dv is always an overestimate. So either it is equal or it is bigger, okay? Then we're going to show that when a vertex is marked as sure, dv has to be equal to ds. Okay, so it always starts higher. And when I mark it sure, it is going to be equal to the shortest distance. All right. Now, if you put these two claims together, they imply this conclusion that dv is the actual distance. Why? Because when v is marked as sure by claim number two, by claim number two, that means dv is equal to the actual distance. And by claim number one, plus the definition of the algorithm, since dv is always an overestimate, after it is marked as sure, it never changes again, okay? So by claim one, when we mark it as sure, it is correct. By claim two, once it's marked as sure, it never increases again, okay? All right. So again, claim one. So again, this is what you would try to do to prove why this is correct in the general case. Um, you forget what I just told you and now you focus on each claim, right? And you say, can I prove that? So our first claim is that no matter what, dv is always an overestimate for the actual shortest distance, okay? Informally, every time we update dv, we have a path in mind, right? And when we update it, we take the minimum of these two paths, right? These two possible options, right? The first option is whatever path we had in mind before, okay? The second option is the shortest path to you and then go from U to V, right? So DV is the length of the path that we have in mind, which is definitely bigger than the length of the shortest path, right? Because the, the shortest path by definition is the smallest path you have in mind, right? Like if you are thinking of a particular path, its length cannot be shorter than the shortest path, right? Um, which is equal to the length of the shortest path. So dv is always bigger than or equal to dsv. More formally, if you actually wanted to prove this, you would use induction. Why? Because you're using the fact that dv is a path we had in mind before and that that is correct. If this is correct, then this is an alternative path where again, du is a path you had in mind before. And then when you take another edge, that is still a path you had in mind before, right? So if you wanted to prove it in more detail, you would use induction. If you're interested in that, you can look at the lecture notes and there is a slide that we're skipping that covers in more detail how you would set this up as an induction proof, okay? Now for claim two is when a vertex U is marked as sure, then DU is equal to the shortest distance, right? So the intuition here is that the first path that lifts U off the ground is the shortest one, okay? So let's prove that or at least uh, see an outline of the proof. Uh, yeah. If you guys like proofs, you should go into research. If you don't like proofs, nobody cares about these. Once somebody knows the algorithm, they're just like, looks good to me. Okay. Uh, so again, you would prove this by induction. 
The inductive hypothesis is that when we mark the teeth vertex V as sure, DV is equal to the shortest distance, okay? Because that's what we're trying to prove. The base case is when T equals to one. So when we mark the very first vertex as sure, then it is equal to the shortest distance. Why is this true? What is the very first vertex we mark as sure? It's the source. And we, when we set it equal to zero. So obviously this is true, right? That's the base case, okay? Now the inductive step is the interesting one. It's actually pretty complicated. So assume by induction that every V you've already marked as sure has its shortest distance. So if you've already marked it as sure, it is the shortest distance. Suppose we're about to add a new node, U, to the sure. We're about to mark it as sure, okay? That is, we picked U here. So we picked it, how do we pick it? We picked it here. Because when we mark it as sure, we first have to pick the not sure node with the smallest estimate du, okay? So we want to show that if this is the case, then du is equal to dsu, okay? So we don't know yet that du has the shortest distance, but we want to show that after, like if we pick it here, then it will have, it will be the shortest distance, okay? And this is actually important. So one of the reasons this proof is important, I'll say, is that it makes use of the fact that you have non-negative edge weights. And so this kind of shows why this algorithm does not work if you have a graph that has negative edges. We're about to see it, okay? So I know this is pretty advanced, pretty in-depth. Uh, how are you guys? How, how are folks following along a little bit? A little bit, yes, maybe, kind of. Okay, this is probably one of the harder proofs that we'll cover in the class. So just, just stick with me. It is important to understand. I think the main key you wanna understand from this proof is where do we use the fact that the edge weights are non-negative? I haven't shown it to you yet, but there is going to be a place where we use the fact the edges are non-negative, okay? And that shows that this algorithm will not work on a graph that has negative edges, okay? Uh, so this is what we're, so now what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to focus on proving this thing. Okay. So again, this is the, this is the whole proof. These things you guys were like, make sense to me. This is the part that's a little tougher. So we're going to focus on proving that. Okay. So what we're going to do is first, we're going to call a vertex good. If it's estimate is equal to a shortest distance, we're going to say that's a good vertex, right? Cause the other ones are bad vertices. We want to show, so again, what we want to show is that U, the U that we pick is good, right? If we show it's good, then we're done, right? That's, we finished the inductive step. Consider a true shortest path from S to U. So let's hypothetically, right, in our mind, think about the actual shortest path, all right? So it's going to start at S and it's going to end at U. Right. And there's going to be some notes in between, right? The actual shortest path, right? Again, this is a thought experiment. The algorithm does not do this, but in order to prove that it's correct, you want to think about it in your head and you say, well, let's consider the true shortest path. Then the vertices here in between, I highlighted them as beige because we actually don't know if they're already sure or if they haven't been marked as sure yet. We know that S is sure because we marked it at the very beginning. And we're trying to show that U is also sure, like it's also good, right? But we don't know anything about the ones in between, right? What we do know is we can say this, consider all the vertices in between, say that Z is the last good vertex before U, okay? So Z could be S, right? There's definitely at least one good vertex. All of these could be bad. The estimates could be off, right? But we're going to say, well, there is some vertex before you on the shortest path that is good. Okay. Let's call Z prime the vertex after Z. Okay. So this is you. So again, we said some Z on the path, somewhere on the path, somewhere along it. That is, it's the, it's the last good one before you. Okay. So it may be that Z is equal to S, right? 
That's why we can say this because we know there's at least one good one, right? It could be that the path is S to U, right? The path could be just this, right? Could be direct. But in our thought experiment, we're considering all possible paths, right? So um, Z is not equal to U because what we're gonna do is we're gonna prove this by contradiction. We're going to assume that U is not good and we're gonna show that that leads to a logical contradiction. Therefore, U must be good. So if we assume that U is not a good vertex, then Z cannot be U, right? Because Z is the last good vertex on the path, all right? Z prime, it may be that Z prime is equal to U, right? That's okay. But that's the, the Z, again, Z prime is the vertex after Z, right? So here's the interesting piece. So we know that our estimate for DZ, because Z is good, right? It is equal to the shortest distance from S to Z, right? We, we picked the node such that it was the last good node on the shortest path. So its estimate is correct. Right, so DZ here, whatever we have in our algorithm for DZ, that is right, All right? Now, this shortest path from S to Z is going to be shorter than the path from S to U. Why? It has less nodes and then one more key thing. Why, why do we know why do we know that the shortest path from S to Z is less than the shortest path from S to U? Yeah. Uh, yes, so we know that the estimate for Z is equal to the shortest path because we said Z is good. And now what I'm trying to show is that I'm trying to show this inequality, that the shortest path from S to Z is shorter than the shortest path from S to U. You um, so that's this part. Because Z is good, we can say this equal sign. But I'm trying to figure out why can I say this inequality? Okay, so here's the answer. In general, subpaths of shortest paths are shortest paths, okay? but because this edge, you know, because the edges cannot be negative, this path cannot get shorter than to Z, right? If my edges could be negative, then it could be the case that the distance from S to Z is like 10, and then this is negative two, negative one, and now my distance from S to U is seven, right? So here is one of the pieces where, in th this is this inequality, is where we use the fact that your weights are not negative, okay? So again, this algorithm does not work if you have negative weights. Why? Because you cannot claim this inequality anymore, okay? So, uh, so here's, I guess, the drawing. So this is DSU, the shortest path from S to U. This is DSZ. And then uh, since U is not good, okay? So again, we're assuming that U is not good. And we're gonna, we're gonna, our goal is to assume it's not good and then that'll lead to a logical contradiction. Therefore, U must be good, right? So because U is not good, then DZ cannot equal DU. So our estimate of DZ, because Z is good, U is not good. These estimates cannot be equal, okay? Therefore, by this line, we know that DZ is less than or equal to DU. By this line, we know that they're not equal to each other. Therefore, DC must be strictly less than DU, okay? So Z is sure. This is by claim one. And then we chose U so that DU was the smallest of the unsure vertices, right? So because we chose U to be the smallest unsure, since we know that DZ is less than DU, Z must be sure as well, right? Otherwise, we would have picked Z. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and that leads to a contradiction. 
Why does that lead to contradiction? Z is sure. Oh, um, right. So because, yeah, so this means that because dz is less than du, this means that z must be sure. But we chose u such that du was the smallest of the unsure vertices. Um, and that's a contradiction because this this z is actually smaller and it's and it's a sure vertex. Oh, uh, all right. So next one. In the other case, okay. The value of dc when c was marked sure. So, okay, so this is explaining why there's a contradiction. So again, uh, if z is sure, then we've already updated z prime. And we actually updated z prime to be this, right? So assuming z is sure, then we already updated z prime. That is the value of dz when z was marked as sure, right? Is equal to its shortest distance, which is less than our estimate for dz prime. So again, by claim one, this also leads to a contradiction. So this is a pretty complicated proof, I'll say. I'm actually getting lost a little bit myself. So if you're feeling lost, don't feel bad. I feel a little lost too. And I wrote this, so understand that. Um, the main thing to remember is that you cannot have negative edge weights. Okay. Uh, okay. TLDR, if you manage to prove that, then back to this slide, we have shown the inductive step holds. Therefore, claim two holds, which means going back to this, claim one is true, claim two is true. Therefore, our theorem is true, which means Dijkstra, Dijkstra does work as long as you have non-negative edge weights. And that's basically it. skip that because we only have one minute left all right so the last thing is like is it fast okay here's the thing it depends on how you implement it okay so the running time of Dijkstra's algorithm is you have n iterations so how many times does this while loop run it runs once for each vertex right because we pick it we pick a vertex and then once we're done with it we mark it as sure and then if it's sure, we never pick it again. And we never go from sure to not sure, right? So it only runs n times, okay? Once per vertex. And the next question is, well, how long does each iteration take, right? So you would need to look, so this is at least O of n times whatever amount of time it takes you to do these three steps, right? So that depends on how you implement the algorithm. Okay, so here's the formula, here's the general formula. So there's three operations, actually we're at 12.50. So I will end it here, let you guys think about the correctness of Dijkstra and try to understand the algorithm. So if I give you an example of a graph with weighted edges, you should be able to know how to run Dijkstra on it intuitively. Like you should be able to like just run it, right? Um, again, you need to remember that Dijkstra does not work when the graph has negative edges. And we are going to cover the running time on Monday um, because it depends on a lot of implementation details. Okay, cool. Yeah, we actually only had six more slides. So that's okay. All right, uh, and then folks on Zoom, that's it. That's it for lecture. So I will stop sharing. Yes, I am. Yeah, corrections go here, and I will take them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh huh.